Hey, shalom everyone, Rabbi Gary here, and I want to invite you to our Passover dinner. It's on April the 19th, it's a Friday night, and we'd love for you to come. All you have to do is to go to PassoverLA.com to sign up, and you'll be able to register and be a part of our Passover celebration. So we're looking forward to seeing you come. Please be seated, and if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm drawing our attention to this portion or this passage this morning because of the experiences Mary Lou and I have had from the body and what it has meant to us and how we can encourage each other in light of being there for one another. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 deals with spiritual gifts. And beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers or brethren, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Yeshua is accursed. And no one can say Yeshua is Lord, except in the Spirit of God. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues or languages. To another, the interpretation of tongues or languages. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Well, that's what we experienced. We experienced the working of the Spirit of God through his individual gifting of persons to reach out to Mary Lou and I. And we need to do that for one another. Now, this is a really fascinating passage. It's a beautiful passage. Let me just show you how this work breaks down. If you look at chapter 12, verse 1, he basically is telling us why the gifts of the Spirit are important. He's telling us they are important. What he's about to write is important. He wants them to know about spiritual gifts. It's important for us to realize this because in many contexts, spiritual gifts are sort of ignored or put on the sideline or treated somewhat insignificantly. But Paul in this verse is telling us, listen, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. Well, why? Because it's important. The second part of this, of this section, we're going to come back, but the second part of this, of this passage focuses on the characteristic of the gifts. And the characteristic of the gifts is that they're all different. There are a variety of them. We're not to expect everyone to have the same gifts as we have. And though they are different in nature, they originate from the same source, the same spirit. So there, in terms of the characteristic of the gifts of the spirit, there's this interesting interplay between unity and diversity. So while there is diversity among the gifts, there's unity in terms of its source. And then when you get down to around, let's say, um, verse, verse 8, or I should say, uh, verse 7, we're then introduced really to the purpose of the gifts, in which he tells us it's for the common good. And then when you get to the end of the section, verse 11, he tells us its source. What, are, what is the source of the gifts? So it's importance, it's in characteristics, it's purpose, and it's source. Now before we sort of go, that's where we're headed. It's 
we're headed. But before we look at that, those particular elements, let me just step back a moment and talk a little bit about this congregation at Corinth. Now, Paul is writing all of this because central, central to the body of Messiah are three virtues. The body of Messiah, whether locally or universally, is to be characterized most particularly by three virtues. The first is love. Yeshua tells us, he's giving us a new commandment, that you love one another. Why is he giving us this new commandment? He's giving us this new commandment because it is to be a virtue, it is to be a characteristic that is to characterize, define the body of Messiah. Remember, when we talk about the congregation, that's me and you. When we talk about our gathering, Scripture uses a variety of metaphors. One metaphor is that we're building. Another metaphor is that we're sheep with a good shepherd. Another metaphor is that we, we are a body made up of many members. It's a metaphor to describe and define the nature of who we are. A body is one, but it has many, many members. And so the members of our body need to be cared for. Put it another way, it needs to be loved. And so just as we're to love our bodies, care for our bodies, take care of our bodies, treat our body as it truly is the temple of the Spirit of God, and Paul uses the collective noun in that when he speaks of the body as the temple of the Spirit of God, the presence of God, what he's saying is we need to be loving one another. How will people know that you are my disciples, Yeshua said, by your love one for another? It's interesting that Paul, in this very section, chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, is going to lead us into the foundation by which the gifts are exercised, and he tells us in chapter 13 that it is in love. A whole chapter devoted to love as a manifestation of the presence of God through the gifts of the Spirit in the body. In fact, he tells us the gifts of the Spirit can be exercised where there is no love. Because he says, if I am to speak as one without love, I become like a clanging cymbal. It doesn't mean that the gifts can operate, but they're not operating effectively, most significantly, most powerfully, unless that virtue, that characteristic of love, permeates the body. And so love is the key, central characteristic of the body of Messiah. It ought to be. It's the central characteristic of God. God is love, John tells us. And over and over again, throughout Paul's letters, he'll talk about loving one another. And he'll talk about things that are the reflection of love, such as forgiving one another, being patient with one another, being long-suffering with one another. And he tells us that, most significantly, we're to manifest the fruit of the Spirit, which he tells us at the front end is love. So if there is a characteristic, a virtue that is to define the body, the very first and foremost characteristic is love. Now, I might have thought it's knowledge of the Word of God. Because I'm sort of cerebrally oriented. And I love to study the Word. We all do. But it's not the knowledge of the Word of God. It is the presence of God in love and in loving one another. The second most critical element, virtue in the body, is unity, is oneness. That's why Paul will say those that create division or divisiveness, he says, you are to uh, depart from, you are to separate yourself from, you are to stay away from. And so in the book of Corinthians, he deals a great deal about division and divisiveness in the body. I say it is one of our top three virtues because this is what Messiah prayed for. In John chapter 17, when he's celebrating Passover and he prays for his disciples, his capstone phrase is that they may be one even as we are one. And over and over again, we read of the unity between the Father and the Son. 
that they work in consort. There's never a conflict between the two. There's never an instance where the father says, this is what you will do, and the son says, I don't know. There is an instance where the Lord would pray, if it be your will, allow this. But they always act in unity and in oneness of purpose. And so he prays that the body of Messiah would be characterized by unity. And that's what we saw here in my absence. I mean, the unity of people coming together, people still coming out to worship. You know, we're not a idolatrous body. We're not worshiping Gary Duroshinsky. We're not here only because Gary Duroshinsky is in the pulpit. We're here because the Lord is here. And he's here whether I'm here or not. And he works through whoever is here to do his work of service and ministry. So we keep coming because we're coming for him. And we acknowledge that he can work through whoever he chooses. And we've seen that sometimes he's worked through a donkey. Sometimes he's worked through a crow. He said to Peter, you know, you'll deny me three times before the crow crows or the rooster crows three times. He worked through all kinds of things. So he can work through me and he can work through everyone else as well. And so the unity of the body is seen in that we come together to make God's will work, whatever his will might be. And the third critical characteristic of the body, not only in love and unity, but it's in the presence and empowerment by the Holy Spirit. That's what 1 Corinthians 12 is about. It's about the working of the Spirit of God, empowering individuals with the gifts that he provides. And this is what Messiah tells us in Acts chapter 1. Didn't he say to the disciples, you are to remain in Jerusalem until you receive the gift of the Spirit of God and you will receive, he says, power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The body of Messiah is to be characterized by love, unity, and the presence of the Spirit of God empowering the individuals through love and unity to do the work of ministry God has for us. Now, how does he do that? He does that by providing gifts. And that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. Now, let's just step back one more time. One more time. This is a letter to a congregation at Corinth. So you're thinking, I'm thinking... How did this congregation come to be, and how is it that this letter is written? Now, you know the story of Paul's ministry. He comes to faith. God has called him as a sent one to bring the good news to the Jewish people in the diaspora and the Gentile nations around. So Paul goes on three major journeys to accomplish that task, to bring the good news of Messiah to the Jewish people in the diaspora, and the Gentile peoples who would be responsive. That's why throughout the book of Acts, he's always in the synagogue. Every place he goes, the first place he seeks out is the synagogue, and he ministers there. On his first journey, he took Barnabas and Mark, John Mark. They head to an island, Cyprus. From Cyprus, they go north into Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and they establish a group of congregations there, and then they head back to their home congregation in Antioch of Syria, near the Lebanese-Syrian border in the north. He goes off on a second journey. He has three, goes off on a second journey. Second journey, he doesn't take Barnabas or John Mark. He takes with him Silas instead. He doesn't take a, a sea route. He doesn't go to Cyprus. This time, he cuts straight across from Syria through Lebanon, modern-day Lebanon, Phoenicia, into Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. He visits the congregations that he established there, and then he heard, heads further west to Europe. He crosses the Aegean Sea with Silas, and along the way, he meets up with Timothy, so he has two individuals with him, Silas and Timothy crosses the Aegean Sea, gets over into Macedonia, the northern part of Greece. 
It's there that he establishes a small body at Philippi. He doesn't stay there very long because there's a great deal of opposition. He heads south along the peninsula and he goes to Berea. There he finds a very responsive group, as he did in Philippi, and he finds another responsive group in Berea, heads further south, leaving Timothy and Silas to oversee these congregations in Philippi and Berea, heads further south to Athens. Doesn't have a lot of response there. There's a lot of conflict, especially among the philosophers. And then from Athens, heads further south to Corinth. Corinth is a major hub. It's a port city. The ancients tell us there were nearly a half a million people in Corinth. It was a metropolitan center. And not only was it a major city, a major metropolitan center, but it was a hub of licentiousness and immorality. That's why in the ancient world to be called a Corinthian or to Corinthianize was a statement speaking of sexual immorality. They had temples to these false gods in which were involved all kinds of temple prostitution. Paul lands in Corinth and meets up with Aquila and Priscilla, two Jews that had been expelled from Rome under the emperorship of Claudius. Claudius was emperor and in the 40s he expelled all Jews from Rome. Two of them, Aquila and Priscilla, make their way to Corinth. They establish a very fine business. They link up with Paul, and they're all tent makers together. And Paul now will serve in this congregation at Corinth for a year and a half. While he is there establishing this body, shortly thereafter he leaves, crosses the Aegean Sea, back to Asia Minor, lands in Ephesus and establishes the congregation in Ephesus. He'll spend three years there. Now the congregation at Corinth had a lot of problems. If you read 1 Corinthians, you'll read of all these different problems. He gets word that things are not well in Corinth. He writes a letter to them, challenging them to get their act together. That letter we do not have. But Paul makes reference to it in the letter of 1 Corinthians that we do have. And he mentions that he wrote to them to challenge them to live as God would have them to live. Because he heard rumors that things weren't going well. So he sent a letter telling them to Corinth, you guys got to get it together. They write back to Paul. And they ask Paul a series of questions. And in the letter called 1 Corinthians, that is Paul's letter responding to their letter in which they asked him a bunch of questions. One of which was, what's this thing about spiritual gifts? And so in 1 Corinthians 12, he writes them about that. Paul gets further word, things are still not good. Evidently, he goes back to Corinth to check it out personally because in 2 Corinthians, he tells us that he was planning to go a third time to Corinth. He leaves Corinth not having resolved things. 2 Corinthians makes that clear to us, chapter 2. And he waits a while, but he does not want to wait until he hears back from them. He takes the initiative and he goes back across to the region of Philippi. He meets up with Timothy. And Timothy reports to Paul, things are looking up, things are looking good. Paul then writes a fourth letter to the Corinthians, which is what we have as 2 Corinthians, praising them for their turnaround. So that's how the circumstances in Corinth emerge. Letters are going back and forth. Things have not been all that well, and now he wants to help them get their congregation together. Now, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that when he arrived at Corinth the first time, he arrived with great fear, trembling, and concern. He says that in chapter 1. And the reason why it appears he came into Corinth and he was fearful and he was trembling, he said, and in weakness, he said, is because all of the previous ministries 
Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica, and Athens were all ministries that he got established, but then there was a lot of opposition. And so when he came to Corinth, he knew of the opposition that was going on. He didn't know how the congregations would fare. And he also went to Corinth alone. He left Tylus, Silas, and Timothy to oversee these congregations that were now facing opposition. So when he gets to Corinth, this major city, with all of this fanfare and immorality and challenges, he comes feeling a sense of weakness. And then he spends that year and a half there, and the congregation is not pulling its act together when he leaves. And so now he writes to them to clarify this issue of spiritual gifts. So let's turn our attention, 1 Corinthians, and let me just share with you these four major points. The first thing is this. He tells them that spiritual gifts are important. Notice what he says. When he opens up, he says, now concerning. The reason he says now concerning is because this is what they had written him about asking him a question. They asked him, what about spiritual gifts? He writes back, now concerning your question about spiritual gifts, he now begins to answer them. And he tells them, brethren, I love that. Even though this congregation of Corinth had all of these problems, even though they struggled fiercely, Paul loved these people dearly. And so he doesn't say, now listen, you guys, get it together. No, he says, now brethren, you're my brothers, you're my sisters, and I love you and I care for you and I want things to go well for you. So brethren, he says to this, I do not want you to be uninformed. The word here is I don't want you to be ignorant about this. Paul uses this expression in numerous times, numerous times in his letters. They always point out something important is about to be said. He says, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. We shall not all die. That there's coming a time when the Messiah will descend to the clouds and the dead and Messiah will rise first. And then we who are alive will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. I don't want you to be ignorant of this. The day of the Lord has not yet come. Some are telling you that. I don't want you to be ignorant of that, he says. It has not yet arrived. He says to the, Ro the letter of the Romans, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. In Romans chapter 11. I want you to understand it's important that you understand God's plan and purpose for the Jewish people as well as the Gentiles. It's important that you understand that what is going to go about or come about with, return, with respect to the return of Messiah. It's important that you understand what spiritual gifts are and how they're to be used. So he's telling, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. You need to be informed of this. You need to be understanding of it. And so what does he tell them? He says, now you know that when you were pagans, when you were practicing your non-godly ways, he says, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols. This is really clever what Paul does. See, he's about to talk about spiritual gifts. What are spiritual gifts for? The communicating, whether verbally, gift of prophecy, gift of tongues, or through actions, gifts of helps, gifts of of giving and so on and so forth. You're going to be communicating the very presence of God. So in contrast to that, he says, remember when you were Gentiles, you were led astray by mute idols. Idols that could not speak. Idols that could not convey the truth of God. For they were no gods at all. And when he says you were led astray, it's a very important word. It means it's a word that is used to speak of leading prisoners into bondage. So when he says that you were led astray by idols, you were being imprisoned by idols. You were being not just led astray, but you were being constrained by them. You were put under bondage by these idolatrous ways. Our world doesn't see this. Our world worships letters after their names, right? seeking the most degree you can get. As you see in the news, people paying millions, I don't get this, millions of dollars to get their kids in a, into a school that they consider significant. Why? Because they're worshiping higher education. Nothing wrong with higher education. I love it, as you know. But 
You don't worship it. It's a tool to become a better person, better informed, so as to be a better servant. So when you worship letters after your name, or if you worship the rung on the ladder that you stand, if you worship what's in your bank account, those things will in bondage you. They will imprison you. They will enslave you. That's what Paul is saying. These idols didn't just lead to the wrong place. These idols had made you a slave. And so we pray millions of dollars for our kids and risk going to jail and other things. But Paul is saying, listen, be Alert and knowledgeable about spiritual gifts that are genuine because they are conveyances of the very presence of God in your midst. He calls them spiritual gifts. This is interesting, too, because literally the word is spiritual things. Spiritual, and it could either be because of the Greek phrase or the, the Greek uh, gender. Greek has neuter and masculine, so it could mean spiritual things or spiritual ones. And of course, if he's talking about spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts are employed by spiritual ones. They're almost like linked together. You can talk about spiritual gifts, but they're exercised by spiritual persons. So that's why I think Paul used this gender formula so as to sort of combine the two in one word. So he's talking about spiritual gifts, but he also has in mind the individuals that embody those gifts or become the conduit for those gifts to operate. So he tells them, look, I don't want you to be ignorant of these gifts, because when these gifts are operating, they're not going to lead you into bondage, lead you astray by the idols that you worshipped when you were in the world of Gentilism. But he's now saying, when these gifts are operated in the Spirit, the Lord is honored as God. That's why he says a person, what is, how does he put it? Therefore, I want you to understand, no one speaking in the Spirit of God can ever say Yeshua is accursed. He's not just talking about verbalizing words. Certainly, they can say those words. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about what those words convey. And so he says, anyone exercising the spiritual gifts he's about to talk about, when they are exercised in the power of the Spirit, Jesus is Lord, is acknowledged. And when they are not, he says, or when they are, it is impossible for Messiah not to be acknowledged as Lord. That's what his point is. So the first point is this. Spiritual gifts are important because they're meant to bring freedom, not bondage. They're meant to accentuate the lordship of Messiah, not to degrade him. He has to be preeminent as the gifts are exercised. We serve one another so that the Lord is glorified and others are helped. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Second thing. Not only does he tell us about the importance of the spirit, uh, the spiritual gifts, he then tells us about their nature. He says, first of all, there are a variety of gifts, same spirit. Variety of service, same Lord. Variety of activities, same God. You notice this in verse 4? You notice it, right? The triunity of God. He makes reference to the spirit, makes reference to Messiah the Lord, makes reference to God the Father may not be absolutely clear as in other places, but there it is. Why? Because there are different gifts, yet they come from the same source, God himself. And what's further emphasized in this is that there can be diversity in unity. God could do a variety of things. What the Spirit of God does is not what Messiah does. The Spirit of God baptizes us in the body of Messiah. Messiah doesn't do that. The Spirit of God seals us, Paul says. The Spirit of God indwells us. The Spirit of God fills us. The Spirit of God grants us gifts. It doesn't say Messiah does those things. It doesn't mean that they're, they act distinctively because they are distinct from one another, yet they are in unity because they act in consort with one another. So they come from the same Spirit, but there are a variety of them. 
And notice when these gifts are utilized, look what he says. He says in verse 6, now there are a variety of gifts for the same spirit. There are varieties of service. This word service is the same word for deacon. We talk about deacons and elders. The word deacon means they're ones who serve. And they are added alongside the elders in order to enable the elders to do, be free to do the service they're called to do. Elders, according to the book of Acts, are primarily called to prayer and the disseminating of the word of God. All other things are up for grabs with respect to the deacons or the servicing ones. That's the word that's used here, same word. So he says these gifts will provide services for one another. And then he says, and these gifts are different, my translation says, verse 6, activities. The word there for activities is where we get the English word for energy. So they are like different kinds of activities occur. Different kinds of, of energies are happening. I was going to say energies are energized. Yeah. <laughs> But as different energies are happening, so there are different workings, different activities are going on. They're all different, but they're all in, uh, sourced by the Spirit of God. So the spiritual gifts are important, and the characteristic of the spiritual gifts are different. We should never say, hey, you should do this too. You know, there's some churches, everyone needs to speak in tongues. This is not true. Not true. That's not what the Scripture teaches. You know, not everybody's got gifts of healings. Not everybody has gifts of prophesying. Not everybody got gifts of teaching. Not everybody has gifts of giving. Not everybody has gifts of helps. Not everybody has gifts of faith. These are all unique gifts. And that's why we are a body that needs each other because none of us has all of it. And it would appear from what this passage is saying is that everyone has at least one gift. And so if we all have one gift, that means we all have to be serving somewhere with our gift. And that's what we have to do. You can't have somebody point it out for you. You have to be able to step back and say, okay, this is the gift God has given me, and I'm willing to share it, and how can, how, where can I get plugged in to utilize this gift? You've got to help us out, too. But we have to all be there. It's important that we don't just come and go, come and go. We have to come and seek out how do we serve others. And then we can go. So number one, the importance of the gift. Number two, the variety of the gifts. Number three is the purpose of the gift. So look at verse seven. To each is given. That's why I say everyone has who knows Messiah. And by the way, having a spiritual gift does not mean you're a spiritual person necessarily. All of us are given gifts. When we first came to know the Lord, none of us were spiritual persons. We were just starting our spiritual journey. We weren't mature in the Lord. You know, we're growing. We're still growing, but we started growing. And yet at that moment, a gift was granted. We had to discover it. Discover gifts in a variety of ways. We're not talking about that so much this morning. But we have to discover them, and then we need to use, use them. And one of the things about using gifts of the Spirit is... It's, it's challenging because you're not operating in your own strength. You're sort of allowing God to work through you. And so there's a cooperation. It doesn't mean you don't learn things or prepare for it, but it does mean at the end of the day you sort of step forward and say, Lord, I'm trusting you to make this happen. And so there's sort of a cooperative element that's involved. So he says in verse 7, for to... Each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. So these gifts are God's working, God's showing up, God's making himself known. And so he says to each one is given for the common good. So while Paul will say the exercise of spiritual gifts can edify oneself, that's what he says about tongues, right? He says if a person was to speak in, in the gift of tongues and not have an interpretation, you edify yourself. Now the question is whether or not he thinks that's good or bad. You know, we don't really know. It's a toss-up. It could go either way. But let's take the good. It's okay to be self-edified, but that's not its purpose. You know, I have to tell you, when I have opportunity to teach the Word, I'm really blessed. 
it's really interesting because I sort of step out of myself and I'm sort of like enjoying it at the same time as I'm saying, okay, what's the next word? You know, it's sort of like these two things are going on at the same time. And so there's a sense in which I feel built up by God when I share my gifts. And I pray that you're feeling built up by God, that you're experiencing him through the gift. And that's, that's how it's supposed to work with all the gifts. This may be just more obvious because it occurs every week and I'm on a stage and I'm propped up. But that's only because I'm 5'6". <laughs> on a good day. Yeah. But... You know, but, but that's the only reason, really. You know, but each one of us has a gift. And however you use that gift, I'll tell you another gift of mine. Some people may, may know this, may not. I don't talk about this gift, but I really have the gift of helps. You know, that's why people say, think I'm micromanaging, but it's sort of like I just like to get engaged. It's why I do sometimes music or I'm out in the back or whatever, you know, I just, or picking things up, you know. I really don't feel like I'm stretching myself in that. I want to be a help. But um, each of us has a gift. And in exercising that gift, it's for the common good, not just for our own blessing. There's just too much of that in our society as it is. You know, this whole me too kind of thing. Nothing against women being taken advantage of that should not be. I'm not talking about the significance of its meaning. I'm only saying that we're living in a society where it's all about me. And here Paul is saying these gifts are not about me only. It's about the common good of everyone. And so lastly, so we talked about it's important. We talked about it's na the, the nature of these gifts. We talked about the purpose for the common good. We haven't talked about the gifts in particularly, but Paul will do that here as he speaks about some. Not all the gifts are mentioned here. You have to also look at Ephesians 4 and uh, Romans 12. And those passages put together give you a fuller picture of the gifts of the Spirit. But the very last phrase, if I can just j jump there, verse 11. All these, all of these gifts, and by the way, at the front end, he talked about spiritual things. He uses the word uh, pneumatikas, I think is, how, is what it is. But it's a word for pneuma, spirit, spiritual things or ones. When he talks, uses the word gifts, different word. There's the word charismata. Charis is the Greek word for grace. And so charismata means grace things, things that are given by grace, which are gifts. That's why we call them spiritual gifts. But they're spiritual graces. They're things that God grants by grace. In other words, people say, well, you know, sometimes you have to tarry to receive the gifts. Not so. The gifts of the Spirit are graces of God. They're given. No strings attached. You don't have to fight for it. You don't have to tarry for it. You don't have to pray deeply for it. You don't have to be holy. You just have to know the Lord, and there's a spiritual gift your way. Now, I'm not saying the gift can be operated well without holiness. I'm not saying that. I'm only saying you have the gift because, remember what it says in Romans chapter 11? The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. They don't, he doesn't take them back. He doesn't say, if you don't act spiritually, I'm taking this. No, he doesn't do that. They may not operate well, but he doesn't do that. He gives, and he gives, and he gives, just like salvation. He doesn't give you a gift of salvation. You say, no, I don't think so. No, he says, gift is forever. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's not going to change his mind and say, well, maybe I will. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that with anything. And the spiritual gifts, like the gift of salvation, is a grace thing. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it, but you're given it. And so out of devotion and dedication and love for the Lord, yes, we yield ourselves to him for them to operate appropriately. We pray, yes, we must pray and ask God to utilize the gifts in our lives. Yes, we must be worshiping him. I'm not denying any of that. But what I am saying is these gifts are sourced in him, not in you. And they can be developed, and we can learn more. 
but they're his gifts to us. And so in verse 11, he says, all these, all of these gifts are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. See, so it's his choice. You may say, look, I, I would really prefer to have, sorry, this is, trust me, this goes with you best. You know, the Lord's not going to say, I don't want to give you this. He's going to say, in fact, Paul says, desire the greatest gifts. You know, nothing wrong with desiring, but at the end of the day, the Spirit of God will give as He wills because He knows you best. And He'll use you through your personality, your natural talents, your individual tastes for His glory and for His honor. And notice this one last thing according to his will. What does that tell us? The Spirit of God is a person. See, he has a will, and he can determine. Chairs don't have wills. You know, inanimate objects do not have a will. Only persons have wills. So you never speak of the Holy Spirit as an it. You always, re re you always speak of the Holy Spirit as a he. And in doing so, we recognize the persons of the Godhead. Now, I wanted to share all these things with you because this is where my head went when all the meals were coming to my home. <laughs> you know, this, is where, this is how it works for me. You know, Someone else may be talking about recipes, but what I think of is gifted individuals moved by the Spirit of God, whether consciously or not, sought to share their gifts, and themselves with Mary Lou and I, for which we will always be grateful and always be thankful. So let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. It is enough. We say it, Passover, Dayenu, it is sufficient. We would say, Dayenu, that you've provided us with salvation. We would say, Dayenu, that you've provided us with food and shelter and clothing. We would say, Dayenu, that you have provided us with a family. But Lord, we can never say enough Dayenus because it never ends. It is always more and more and more and more that you shower upon us. Your blessings are never ending. And so, Lord, we are just grateful that you are our God and that we are your people. We are grateful, Lord, that you have granted us the greatest gift of all, salvation through Yeshua the Messiah. And we're thankful for the gifts of the Spirit of God that you entrust to us. May we always be seeking them May we always be seeking you and utilizing them for the common good that we would find Beth Ariel being a haven of love, a haven of unity, and a haven where the Spirit of God is empowering and is demonstrating his presence. May we be yielded to you, dedicated to you, that you, Father, would be pleased to make yourself known through us. We bless you and we thank you. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. The ushers will come, and if uh, you're planning on continuing to worship the Lord through giving, this is your opportunity. If you're guests with us this morning, please don't feel compelled in any way, shape, or form. This is for our congregants to be supporting the body that's here. And those of you online that the Lord has blessed through our, our service and our videotapings of our messages and recordings, you can give to us as well. Give to the Lord through us uh, by texting your gift to 925-718-0020. We're very... Uh, 925-718-0020. And we're grateful for your gifts and make sure that you're praying for us as we seek to reach out to the lost sheep of the House of Israel here in the greater Los Angeles area. You can also uh, write to us. We'd be more than happy to, to correspond with you if you would like. And if you'd like to send in a gift, you can do that to P.O. Box 5340, 
West Hills, California, 91308. Well, let's stand together as we bring our service to a close. Let's sing in worship to him and then we'll receive our benediction. Shalom, everyone. And thank you so much for checking out this week's teaching. If you like this video, click the subscribe button to join our online community. If we've impacted you and you want to partner with us, you can click the Give Here button on my left. We would love to have you join us in person next Saturday, so plan your visit now by going to messianicla.com or by clicking the link below.